Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Careers in Psychology program. Um, this evening, today is February uh, 9th, uh, 2023. My name is Roni Rufi. I'm an assistant director, career counselor at the UCLA Career Center. Um, we're joined tonight by my colleague, Christina and Randy, and our amazing panelists who have graciously put in their time to be with us this evening to talk to you guys about their career path and why they chose the particular path that they have chosen and um, to allow you to learn more about their, their profession. Um, I'm gonna start off by um, doing a career center overview, but I do wanna invite Randy um, to start off the session as well to talk about um, the di psychology department and how um, the psychology department here at UCLA is here to support you as Bruins as well. So Randy. Thank you, Brony. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Randy Lesko. I'm one of the advisors in the Psych Undergrad Advising Office. Uh, I have probably met with some of you. Uh, others may have met with some of my colleagues in our department. Um, we're here to serve students who are a part of the psychology, psychobiology, and cognitive science majors, as well as the cognitive science minor and the applied developmental psychology minor. Um, we're here for advising. I know enrollment's coming up, so I know a lot of you probably have some questions in terms of what classes you could be looking at taking uh, in the next term. Um, I would recommend first and foremost to look at the schedule of classes, um, making sure that you're reading the course notes for all of the courses. That's gonna detail exactly when you're able to enroll. Another reminder really quickly, I know it's kind of different from career advising, but I, this is a good chance to address a lot of you. Um, the Tech Department doesn't enforce prerequisites for our classes, but we enforce uh, enrollment restrictions like major standing and class standing. So look for those when you're looking for classes. Um, Generally, though, any questions you have for us, our department has moved to Message Center. That's the best way to reach us. So we encourage you to message us there. You can either do that through my UCLA or through our website. If you click, um, there's a couple of different places where you'll see the Message Center link there. So go ahead and send your messages there. Um, we are currently at 4,600 students total in our department. Um, and we do our best to get back to everyone as soon as we can. So give us a little time uh, to get back to your messages. We try to get back to you uh, within four business days, but usually it's within two or three. So um, send your messages if you have them. Uh, I'm really excited to have this opportunity to uh, work with the Career Center on this uh, event for you today. I know we get a lot of questions from you all. What can you do with your psych major? Here's one of those answers today. So uh, I'm gonna pass it back to Ronnie. Thank you so much, Randy, and thank you for your collaboration over the years. We really appreciate it. All right, um, so I'm gonna quickly go through some of our resources for those of you who have not utilized our services before, just to get a, just a general idea. Um, again, the number one question we get is how do we schedule a counseling session with a career counselor at the Career Center? So we do offer two types of counseling sessions. We have um, both of our counseling sessions are in-person and virtual. So um, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, we offer our drop-in sessions. Those are very quick 15-minute sessions where we can talk to you about um, getting help regarding your resume, cover letter, job and internship search. Um, we have a lot of students coming in as well and starting the conversation as far as what do I do with my major? I'm not quite sure. Um, but again, these are short 15-minute sessions. So those conversations, we tend to keep more for the one-on-one -on -one sessions, which I'll also talk about. Our, our drop-in sessions are super slow. I mean, if it isn't even a touch point, I would highly encourage you guys to come in and meet us at least during the drop-in sessions so that you're more comfortable with our resources and learn about our resources. Our one-on-one -on -one sessions are a little bit more challenging in obtaining for you to obtain, unfortunately, um, because there's only so many of us and, and so many of you guys. But those are posted every Friday um, on Handshake from 2 to 5 p.m and they're visible only up to two weeks in advance. So if you end up going on the calendar on Handshake and you, you, you don't see any appointments for the next month, that's not the case. Um, they're only visible up to two weeks. So we encourage you to keep checking and make sure, because um, a lot of students do end up canceling those, canceling those appointments and those appointments come back up um, and are visible on your calendar. Um, so those one-on-one sessions, again, are more for career development, Questions like, what do I do with my major? If there's personal statements for grad school, PhD programs, and, and alike. So those sessions are appropriate for those types of um, types of appointments. Um, Handshake is a great, great resource, again, for events and workshops as, as you're able to um, learn about this program through Handshake. So 
definitely take a look at our events page on Handshake for additional career fairs and workshops and graduate school info sessions and, and things like that. Um, we do, as you know, graduate school advising. So if you are thinking about going for your master's in psychology or MFT programs or PsyD or PhD programs, Christina and I, Christina and I um, see students on a regular basis in helping them and supporting them in timeline, personal statement and things like that within your application cycle. Um, and our website's really, really helpful as far as just overall articles and resources and so on for you to take a look at. Um, so feel free, a lot of our resources obviously is through Handshake. Um, feel free to come into a drop and get to know us, connect with us, and we can definitely target and tailor um, our resources to, to your needs and what it is you need support with. Um, speaking of Handshake, again, these are just some of our virtual resources that go through Handshake that I think are really important for you guys to be aware of. Most of these resources, again, you have to access it through Handshake so that you don't get charged to, but like if you need support with your resume, we're more than happy to help you during a drop-in session, but VMOC is one of our really well-known databases that allows you to start your resume if you even needed to from scratch. Um, you upload your resume on VMOC, it gives you feedback, it talks about how to put together detailed bullet points and so on. So um, VMOC is a really great resource. First and first hand again is another wonderful resource where it allows you to learn about different industries. So any career, be it you know within the field of psychology, if you're interested, um, th there's tons of career guides on there as well that you can utilize. So resources like first hand would be really helpful as well. So take a look at our resources on Handshake, our online resources. There's a lot of materials here that definitely would help you within your career development. For those of you who are graduating this year, um, just so that you are aware of your alumni services and access, um, you have access to the Career Center and working with career counselors up to three months after you graduate. So if you're graduating in June, you have access to make appointments with us all the way till the end of September. Um, unfortunately, after that, because of, of our capacity and so on, we're not you know, able to, to assist you with the one-on-ones but you do have access to Handshake up to a year after that. And with that comes, uh, you know, ability to find opportunities so jobs and internships that are posted. And honestly, again, a lot of times alumni even have access to all our virtual events. So hopefully, you know, once you graduate, you still are able to participate in programs like this as long as they're virtual and you're able to access the Zoom link and so on. Um, so you do still have access to Handshake a year after you graduate. All right, very quick um, overview. Again, I, I'm encouraging you guys to definitely utilize drop-ins um, and come in and, and learn more about our resources and so on. But I do wanna get started with the panel this evening because I know that you guys are all very excited to meet our panelists. Um, I hope that you guys all had a chance to um, you know, do some research on our wonderful panelists tonight, take a look at their LinkedIn profile, learn a little bit more about them ahead of time so that you can you know, make those breakout room sessions a little bit more meaningful and so on. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I'm gonna ask a handful of questions um, of, each of the panelists and move forward from there. Um, and I am going to change my setting to... spotlight setting. So let's go ahead and stop sharing. All right. And then let's go ahead and all right. Um I put it in the spot light setting and we're gonna go ahead and get started um with our panelists with doing a quick introduction. And Dr. Shoham, you're first on my screen. If you can please go ahead and briefly introduce yourself. And um, we're gonna try and if possible, make the introductions a little bit shorter because I know you'll be talking about yourselves and your experience um, as we answer other questions. Um, includes your name, your education and major for, with, that, um, in undergrad and grad school. A little bit about your current um, made, your work history um, and it, what it is that you do today. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad to be here. I'm Dr. Carolyn Shoham. 
I have my master's in counseling psychology and my PhD in clinical psychology. I've been in private practice in Beverly Hills for about 20 years. Um, I have my BA also in psychology from UCLA and got my master's and PhD at a private graduate school. Um, I've been working with individuals, adolescents and couples and family. Um, I also uh, supervise associates and I provide consultation to um, other therapists if needed. Thank you so much. Um, next on my screen, I have Dr. Cook. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Lauren Cook. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. I have a private practice here in California called Hardship Psychological Services. Got my undergrad at UCLA, go Bruins, in psychology and communication studies. And then I went to the other side of town to USC for my master's in marriage and family therapy, and then went to Pepperdine for my doctorate in clinical psych, their PsyD program. Uh, and I also do a lot of speaking with different companies and universities to talk about how we can promote more mental health in the workplace and on our college campuses. Thank you so much. Next, I have Dr. Abrashami. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here again. I think the last time I was, I did this was before COVID. So, so fun to be back. Um, I'm a clinical, licensed clinical psychologist. I got my BA in history and psych at UCLA, and I got my PhD at a private university um, in, Pas in Alhambra, Pasadena. I, I've worked in a variety of settings, but it's mostly been with adults with severe and chronic mental illnesses. I work in mental health centers. I worked in college campuses. I worked in residential dual diagnosis. And I currently work in a PHP, which is kind of like a partial hospitalization program, working with, clinic, with clients with severe and chronic OCD, trauma, and addiction. And I also have a small private practice on the side, but my majority of my job is working at the clinic. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Erin, I pronounced that right correctly. <laughs> Said that perfectly. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Dr. Cheryl Arad. I'm a licensed clinical and forensic psychologist. Um, I got my BA at UCLA, uh, not in psychology, but in what we then called women's studies, which is uh, gender studies. And then my master's and doctorate, I got a doctor of psychology, a PsyD degree at, I think the same private university people keep referencing, <laughs> which is, uh, uh, I went to CSPP, California School of Professional Psychology, which has gone through some changes and name changes, which may be why some people are just referring to it privately. Um, I was licensed about 25 years ago. I'm in practice in Beverly Hills and I do a lot of different things. I have um, a busy private practice that focuses on trauma recovery and post-traumatic growth. And I also work with a lot of creative artists and high profile performers. Um, I do forensic psychology where I do evaluations for um, uh, court cases and um, try to, you know, forensic psychology is the nexus between the legal system and psychology. And some of those things led to doing um, a lot of media and, and speaking about true crime, um, high profile cases, commentary about things like that. And I, I do, I've done quite a bit of television on, uh, uh, I was on a, an HLN TV show for three years. Um, uh, Access Hollywood talking about EMDR, um, criminal profiling on, on uh, investigation discovery. It's kind of fun to be able to take psychological ideas and speak about them to places where people may not necessarily walk into a consulting room. So there's the clinical piece and the media piece. And um, I contributed recently to a new uh, 
criminal justice textbook on forensic mental health. And um, I'm on the board of an organization called PAVE, Promoting Awareness, Victim Empowerment, which uh, helps uh, with survivor support and bystander intervention and things for sexual violence. And, uh, uh, and I'm an enormous proponent of EMDR therapy. I'm certified and I'm a consultant in training and I provide some consultation for other people in EMDR. So nice to be here. Thank you so much. Um, and Dr. Pinkus? Not a doctor, but thank you. <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, uh, while both my parents were Bruins, I actually left for the East Coast and got my master, or sorry, my uh, BA at Vassar College, which is a really small college in upstate New York. Um, I was an English major and studio art major. Um, so totally different direction. Uh, and came back and went to Pepperdine to get my master's in clinical psychology. Um, from there, I worked at a residential treatment center where I, in a roundabout way, got really, really, really into couples work. And I totally could explain that, but um, became a, a certified couples and sex therapist, which is the primary focus of my practice. I'm also trained in uh, EMDR and brain spotting. So I use that in conjunction um, with a lot of my couples um, who are generally coming in with an attachment trauma, if not other traumas layered on top of that. Um, I was the former, uh, a former staff member and co-director of the American Association of Couples and Sex Therapists, which is out of UCLA. Um, and I was on the board of the Gestalt Therapy Institute of Los Angeles. I am a relational Gestalt therapist, and I'm happy to explain what that means as well. Uh, and I'm an adjunct professor at Pepperdine now. So I teach couples therapy there and their sex therapy course as well. Thank you so much. Um, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll continue the next question with you. Um, you know, the number one question that I get, um, from students interested in clinical psychologies, how do I choose which degree would be right or which degree should I, you know, there's always the MFT route, PsyD, PhD. Um, can you kind of talk about your reason behind, you know, why you chose your particular degree and, and um, how is it that you see it beneficial for, for the type of work and the clients that you work with? Um, and any recommendations as far as if students ever, you know, ask the question of what's, what are the differences? And, and, and if you can explain a little bit of that um, as well. Absolutely. So in terms of how I chose my degree, um, first of all, in California, MFT is kind of the, the big one. If you're going to choose between that and being, um, uh, so, um, that tends to be kind of more spread throughout the country. So if you're really looking for a license, that's going to be more well-recognized throughout the country, you might go for or a PsyD or beyond. MFT is really is LA girl. I'm not moving. I've been to the East Coast. I've done the snow. I'm not going back. Alexandra, your video keeps freezing. I don't know if it's on my end or. Oh, sorry. Is it better now? It's better now. So we just kind of missed the last like 10, 15 seconds of what you said. Oh, I was just saying that that uh, I wasn't going to leave California because I'm an LA girl. So I'm, I knew that I, MFT would work for me. Um, so I just, looked at what programs were out there. I wanted to get my program done as fast as possible. Pepperdine was the fastest possible. It's about a year and a half. Um, and, and from there, why I haven't now moved on to getting a PsyD or a PhD, my thinking has always been that if a door hasn't been closed to me, I don't need to kind of continue that education. I've been able to be an adjunct professor. I've been a co-director of a program at UCLA. My practice is doing very well. Um, I have a full practice. I, I feel very confident in my feet, in my abilities, in my training. Um, if I ever do find a door that feels closed, it would require either a PsyD or a PhD. I'm more than happy to go there. Certainly teaching positions are more available to those with PhDs and PsyDs depending on the university. So if that's something that you're interested in or in a research component, you definitely want to be going into more of a PsyD or a research space. I knew I was clinical. I knew I'd rather be in the space with my clients. I knew that I wanted that, that contact. Um, so that was kind of my thinking, but I would say, you know, not most people don't end up having the same path as me in terms of being able to be in the teaching position that I've been in. So if you are looking for a PhD or, or, or sorry, are looking for a teaching position, I would go PhD or PsyD. 
Thank you so much. Um, Sanam, you're next on my screen. Can you talk a little bit about your degree track and, and why you chose that for yourself and in your profession? Um, I did actually go to CSVP. It's just, it's so hard to sometimes explain it. I just, so thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I decided to go to, I got, decided to get my PhD mostly because at the time I really wanted to do research, testing and teaching. Um, I, I wanted to be able to do a lot of more of the cycle that is, uh, the testing that goes into it, the research and PhD was the route to go. Um, and also the, I wanted to make sure that I got, I went to a school that allowed a lot of clinical and a lot of research, which is where my PhD kicked in versus SID. Um, I got, I was able to do a year of testing um, and then I ended up staying testing for, for about three years, four years. And then I got three years of pre-doc and help doing pre-doc hours. And I also got a chance to do a research and learn how to do research and how to do the statistics and everything that was part of it. So for me, PhD at Alliant Lion allowed me to get both the research aspect and the testing aspect that I wanted, as well as a lot of clinical hours. So by the time I graduated, I had enough to feel confident, confident to do clinical, but also know that if I got a job in teaching or in research or in any other areas, I, I, still, could, I still could do them. Thank you so much. Um, Cheryl, you're next on my screen if you want to take this idea approach a little bit. Sure. I was just thinking about how much times have changed um, in that, you know, 25 years ago, a PsyD was, um, even though the licensing is identical and, and the training is very similar to a PhD in psychology, um, except you have maybe a few more specialized clinical classes and a few less statistics classes, which personally made me very happy. Um, it was sort of, it was not as available in terms of teaching for a PsyD at a lot of universities and people were really encouraged to do a PhD. So it's, it's heartening to hear that that, that equity has, has kind of shaken out differently. And that said, I was also an adjunct professor at, at CSPP for a number of years and, and had a wonderful time teaching there. But again, it was a private clinically oriented program. Um, I love, being a psychologist, I love the freedom of being able to do so many different kinds of things um, and be able to work in, in different areas. I'm also inspired like by Alexandra saying that all these doors have been open and she's kind of made her own doors. I think that's fabulous and, and you need know, to be able to, to have your work speak for yourself and to not limit yourself in advance by thinking, oh, well, I need this or I, I need that. I've also found that a lot of times, I think women in particular tend to think that uh, in order to be qualified to apply for something, you have to already have mastered it already. And um, whereas if somebody's mastered it already, maybe they're ready to stretch and do something, even something new. Um, so being a, a clinical psychologist in many, many ways has been, I think, really empowering and helpful. One of the things that I don't know if we'll talk about more um, that has changed some things is the uh, the appearance of coaching and how some of the dynamics have shifted in terms of, on the one hand, it's, it's opened up a different channel, but also a, a much less regulated channel. So I, I think maybe we can talk about how some how people are navigating the existence of, of that and how there are very qualified people doing coaching, but also people who aren't and and um, how people distinguish themselves. And sometimes being a licensed psychologist can kind of constrict some of the things because of the the ethical regulations that we have, there are certain things that we can't do, like ask for testimonials or, or uh, uh, promise results or do things like that, which uh, coaches can do. Um, so there, there, the, the future in the playing field has, has shifted a bit in some interesting ways. And I'm, you know, I'm very happy with my, my work. I'm very curious to hear what people are, are thinking and saying about what this changing landscape is bringing. Thank you so much. Um, Lauren? 
Yeah, I think the only thing I would add is somebody who did go the route of getting a master's in marriage and family therapy and a PsyD. Uh, I would encourage folks to be really intentional about you know, their long-term game plan. Uh, I think if I were to do it all over again, <laughs> I probably would have gone straight to the PsyD. Um, at, at Pepperdine's program, their PsyD program, you have to have a master's already to be able to do their PsyD program and it truncates it where it's a four-year program instead of five years. But most PsyD programs, you get your master's along the way. And I think, you know, a lot of folks don't always realize, myself included, candidly, at the time is that those hours, those 3000 hours that you need as an MFT, or let's say you get an LCSW as a social worker, do not count towards the 3000 hours towards becoming a licensed clinical psychologist. I know one colleague who did the whole 6000 hours, good for her. Um, but I decided to forego the MFT hours and pursue just the licensed uh, clinical psychologist hours. Um, so, you know, these programs are expensive, quite frankly, and I think it is really important to know what you want long term, uh, just so that you use your time well and the funds well, too. So that's that's all I'll add on that point. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Um, Caroline, any other final thoughts and why you chose your PhD track? Yeah, so I actually was in a program where I knew my end goal was to get my PhD, but alongside I had taken so many classes that I was able to get my master's. But um, at a time in that program, the, it was called in counseling psychology, which is kind of equivalent to MFT right now. Um, so I did, I along the ways I did get my master's and then I continued to get my PhD. Um, you know, PsyD, although it's been around for quite some time, I want to say about 20 years ago, PhD was still kind of one of the stronger um, uh, degrees out there. And I chose PhD over PsyD specifically um, having thoughts that I might want to become a professor and teach at certain universities. And I knew the job opportunities would be a little bit easier with a PhD in addition to if I wanted to ever do research, which wasn't really my my niche. Um, so I used all of that knowing that my end goal would be, or my main goal would be to open up a private practice and to really be in the room with the clients, which is what I really enjoy. Yeah. Um, but like I said, I do a lot of, you know, other things such as, you know, consultation and, and supervision. And so I get bits and pieces of that in there too. Um, but like I said, right now, what you can do with a PsyD is almost very equivalent to what you can do with a PhD. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to actually just to continue the conversation with you for my next question. And you touched a little bit about, you know, your typical day and what it is that you do. Can you kind of walk us through maybe a typical day or a typical week within your practice and so on? And what is it that, you know, you do as well that you might not maybe realize that within within your position, you might be able to accomplish and do as well as a professional. Okay, so I think the beauty of private practice is that you kind of really pick and choose what you want your daily schedule or weekly schedule to be, yeah? Um, so being that, you know, throughout the 20 years, I've gone through changes in my own personal life. I've always had the option to, um, you know, increase my clientele and have a bigger practice. And then when I needed it, I was able to kind of taper down and cut my practice um, on a regular basis. Um, my, I pretty much see clients back to back. I was at a point where I was seeing clients from eight o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock at night, pretty much back to back. And I was able to do that for some time. But I think part of being in private practice is really being aware of how much you give in each session and the, the awareness of what toll that takes on you as a therapist emotionally and really knowing where you want to kind of draw the line and, and where to figure out those boundaries. So 
you know, throughout the years, I have kind of been able to pay more and more attention to, you know, yeah, I can do eight to eight, but for how long before, you know, I, I go through that burnout. Um, so I've been able to cut back a little bit and then I, and I ended up including, you know, supervision and consultation and other aspects of doing that. So in any week, I'm doing a couple hours of supervision um, where, you know, for MFT associates, which is, you know, changed from being in the room with the clients in addition to consultation. But the chunk of my weekly um, schedule is seeing individuals and couples. Um, and like I said, the, the flexibility is something in private practice that really works for me. Thank you so much. Um, Lauren? Yeah, sorry, I was just responding to that question in the chat there as well. Uh, so, you know, what I love about this field is that day to day, every day can be different. And shout out to Christina on this call from the Career Center. She sat with me when I was an undergrad and really helped me define what my values were and what felt like a good fit for me. What I really learned through that process, I definitely have an entrepreneurial spirit. So if you identify as an entrepreneur in any way, this is a great field for you. Um, one of my goals was to start a private practice and I was able to do that pretty quickly after getting licensed. Um, our field is very quickly evolving. You know, if you're on TikTok these days, you see how much mental health is all over these platforms. That's how I get all of my clients through TikTok, believe it or not. Um, and Instagram. And so folks are, are looking for support in those ways. And that's where I see most of my clients. I love working in the age range of 13. That's the youngest I'll go all the way through like mid 40s with some couples work as well. But every day is a little bit different for me. I might be doing a virtual keynote for a company like Salesforce or 23andMe. And then I may be getting on a plane the next day to go speak at NYU, you know, so it just really varies day to day. Um, and there's so much you can do with it if you want to help destigmatize, you know, mental illness, whether, you know, you want to have a podcast or I've got a book coming out um, this fall. And so there's so many ways that you can share great information with people if you're passionate about mental health. Uh, and you can do it in the one to one, which I really love with individual services. And you can do it on a broad scale, too, if you want to give keynotes, lectures, things like that. Um, be a professor, lots of different pathways. So every day is a little bit different. I get to schedule my hours every day, which I love. Um, and I can't say enough good things about this field. I don't know many therapists who say they don't love their job. In fact, I don't think I've, I've found one yet. Um, if you find your niche and the population you love to work with, it's such a rewarding field. Thank you so much. Um, Cheryl? What does a typical day look like for you? A lot like Lawrence, actually. <laughs> uh, I one of the things I really love also is that every day is different. And um, I, I do get to see who I work with. I love the people that I work with. I love seeing the changes that happen and the growth and the and the, you know, taking somebody from really um, feeling like their quality of life is 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 really constricted and watching them be able to do things they never thought they could do and and shift the way they feel deeply about themselves is incredibly rewarding. Um, my day may be working with people privately one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, it may be doing a, you know, a, a Zoom or a studio appearance. Again, being able to talk about mental health issues with people and having, you know, having an opportunity to reach people who aren't going to walk into an office and be in therapy or don't have access to it and go, oh my God, I understand what this means now is, is really rewarding. Um, I overdid it during the pandemic. I was also, you know, working too many hours and uh, really kind of started to feel a bit burnt out in a little bit, like I was overextended and was, have really kind of shifted how many hours a week of one-on-one -on -one I'm doing. And I'm, I'm doing some more um, kind of scalable things, programs, uh, working on uh, more group offerings. Again, you can have a lot of creative endeavors as well 
if you are a self-starter, if you're somebody who is, you know, wants to put your, yourself out there and kind of, you know, think in in some new ways. I mean, there there's a lot of traditionalism in our field and uh, yet the field is evolving a lot. And so right now we're sort of, we have a foot in, in each world, I think. And uh, so I think the people who don't get on that, um, uh, you know, are, are going to be more isolated. I mean, it's, it's incredible to work one-on-one, -on -one, but it also is one person at a time, one hour at a time, and you only get paid when you're working. And, you know, unless you join a group practice, you don't have benefits unless you start a group practice or you have people working for you. And, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways that this can look, but I, I think that, um, if people are looking for the, the safety of some kind of a, a great amount of external structure where you do the same thing every day, um, clinical work is probably not going to be their thing. But I think that, you know, my, my day, my day is enriched every day, I think, whether it's, it's writing or researching or, or doing a talk or, or, working with people clinically and also scheduling some downtime and some connecting time. Because the other thing that I will say about uh, clinical work or solo clinical practice, like I, I have my own practice in, in Beverly Hills, um, you need to really make time to connect with your colleagues and the professional activities and the talks and the brunches and the, you know, the consultation groups and things that we put together are so valuable in terms of connecting and enriching, especially now. So I, you know, I, I think that's an important piece also. Thank you so much. Um, we're starting to see questions in the chat, so I do want to get to that. But I do want to hear um, everyone else, the other panel is kind of day to day activities, and then we'll, we'll turn it into the chat because there's some wonderful questions from students as well. Um, Senam, can you kind of walk us through your day to day as well? Is it pretty similar to your fellow colleagues, or do you notice something different that you do in your private, in your practice as well? Um, I mean, most of what I do is one-on-one -on -one individual. Um, I see my clients because of the because of the place I work with between four to five times a week. So my my seeing them tends to be very regular. I see certain people for a very long time, four to five times a week. I also run a lot of groups, um, both psycho ed and um, process groups. So most of my days divided between individual sessions and then um, groups. I also because of the kind of the structure of the place I work with, there's a lot of consultation with different um, with different group members, whether it's their program director or their psychiatrist or other group members. So my day is um, divided between kind of doing individual session, doing consultation with other staff to how to help the client and then running groups. And um, that's kind of how my day goes mostly. And then if there's a crisis and there's always crisis intervention or if there needs to be assistance with other things, but it's very, it's my day is a little bit more structured. Thank you so much. And Alexandra? How does my day slash week go? Um, so I do a four day work week in terms of seeing clients, um, which I think is really lovely and really gives me, you know, the contact that I want and, and all of that, but also gives me a little bit of breathing space. I see approximately five to six clients a day. Um, so my day kind of looks like I wake up, I play with my dogs in the backyard, I work out, and then I start at about 10 or 11 and I see three clients and then I have a two hour break because I need that. Anyone who sees like multiple clients, like five clients in a row, like you will burn out eventually. Um, and then I have a break and then I do another three in the afternoon. Um, and I might get a workout in the middle or something like that. I also uh, am in a, two different consultation groups, actually three now. Um, one for EMDR, one for EFT, and one that's just like my core that I graduated with and we still meet with each other. Um, so consultation is huge. It's where you get to meet with other therapists um, and you get to talk about, you know, your cases and share any struggles you're having. And it is a, such a, a beautiful support system. I love that I have my group that I graduated with from years ago and we still meet with each other every week, every two weeks. And sometimes we're just talking about our personal lives and how it's impacting our work. Um, and, and then I have these other programs that are more specific around my EMDR training, around my EFT training. Um, 
so I've got that. And then when I'm lecturing, which right now I'm taking, you know, this uh, semester off because sometimes I need a break. Um, I tend to do that on Thursdays. So right now I would technically be lecturing. Um, and uh, so sometimes that's in the middle of my week and then I'll do grading on Mondays because that's my day off. Uh, and then I do uh, guest lecture circuits. So I'm on this panel here. I'm do, doing a couple different guest lectures um, at different training programs uh, like Southern California Counseling Center. Other ones are like Maple Center, things like that. Um, so I might do a circuit there or go to LMU or something like that. Um, and then I'm really uh, strict about taking my weekends off. Like when my day ends on Friday, my work phone stays in my office, which my office is in my backyard. So when my clients come here, they come into my backyard, they see my two golden retrievers, they have this really lovely experience, they get to leave and have a little snuggle session for a second. Um, but uh, yeah, Fridays, my, my work phone stays in here. I, I come back on Monday, I check it, but I really am very boundaried about it because I need to maintain my own kind of sanity. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to turn it. I know some of you, thank you for responding to students' questions on the chat. Um, but I, I do see a question that I, um, if, you know, one or two or three of you like to put in some input or advice. Um, students ask us all the time, you know, um, upon graduating, be it with psychology major, cognitive science major, whatever undergrad major I have, I am thinking about pursuing an MFT or PsyD or PhD. Um, what are some experiences maybe within a gap year that you would recommend students pursuing? Because I know it can be a little bit challenging in finding opportunities if you don't have a degree to a certain extent. Um, but as far as like maybe gap years um, is one question. What, what kind of experiences do you recommend students taking on within let's say a gap year? Um, within that question, the, the student also asked, do you recommend taking a gap year? Or it's gap years recommended in order to be able to apply to these types of graduate degrees and so on. Um, but I think more importantly, like what kind of jobs would hire students, let's say with a psychology major who don't have an advanced degree in your experience, what have you seen students, students pursuing before starting graduate, the graduate degree or graduate program? And I'm just gonna open it up to the panel. I answered this in there very briefly. So I'll just kind of piggyback off of what I already said. I was an English major with a studio art, you know, background as well, like not my field at all. I was in therapy from childhood because my parents are huge fans of it. Um, and both my grandparents or grandmothers are psychologists, but um, so it was in my head, but it wasn't my background. I, when I came back, I got a secondary arts degree. That's also not related by the way. <laughs> um, and so I didn't even start this until like later on. And none of the things that I participated in were actually related to psychology. My feeling of any kind of master's program, I can't speak to the PsyD programs, but the ones that I spoke to of master's programs was that what they really want to know is that you're willing to do the work because a lot of what you're going to end up doing when you go into this field is you have to do your own work. You have to be able to be introspective. You have to notice what's coming up, what we call counter-transference in the room um, and be able to you know, not point the finger at the client at, at all times that it's their fault because you actually play a role. This is a relationship. So they want to know that you are introspective. They want to know that you're willing to kind of step into that role of like, what's my stuff that I bring in here? And they want to know that you have passion for it. Beyond that, I don't know that the list of jobs you had before really is a huge deal breaker or winner in one way or another. I think it just adds to your life experience and how you, you show how you handle various moments in life. Um, in terms of what jobs are out there that are going to be psychology jobs that are going to take you, I'll hand that to somebody else because I didn't do that. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Thoughts about uh, that? Go ahead. Should I go ahead? Okay. So I had a position before, as, as, as I was working on my BA in psychology at UCLA, I had a position that was within the field, but didn't really need a master's degree or anything higher than where I was at the time. I was working as a behavioral specialist under the supervision of a psychologist as just the, uh, you know, it's, do you do, I didn't need a degree for that. Um, and I was working with special needs children such as like autism and, and Down syndrome. And it was, you know, I got education through the, the institute that I was hired with different techniques. 
Um, so I worked there for some time and then I ended up working as kind of like a private consultant for a lot of the families and would show up to school and join the parents to do, uh, you know, the, the meetings and the IEPs. And that was a position I had for some time um, while I was working on my um, BA. Yeah. So there are some job opportunities out there that may be related to your field um, and that you could get some experiences. Thank you so much, Caroline. Um, anyone else have similar experience or different experience as far as opportunities um, that they would recommend students or have seen students pursue or colleagues know that they have pursued in the past? Um, I, I want to really echo that if you are interested in, in doing any kind of clinical work, it's so important to do your own personal therapy. It is so, so important to, to know yourself and to not just kind of want to be in the therapist chair, but to know what it's like to be in the client chair. And it helps with everything, as Alexander was saying. And one of, one of the things that I had an opportunity to do was uh, to volunteer on a crisis line when I was much younger, and it was incredibly, um, you know, it was it was incredibly rewarding, and it was it was a good kind of dipping my toe in to do peer counseling and to really see that yes, I enjoy this and I want more tools and I want to be able to do more to to help people and I can tolerate people having big feelings and emergencies and things that are that are going on and and that was that was really important. The other thing is that there may be experiences that you all have in your lives that don't look like. Or, or, or you may not immediately think that these are preparation for going into this field. But if you have, if you competed in a sport, if you had a, a particular issue in your, in your family that was overcome or something that you overcame, or if you have some kind of, there, there are specialized experiences that can sometimes really lead you to a niche in this field or or you recognize you have a special feeling for a certain population and you really love working with them and those things can show up in unexpected ways so keep an eye out for that also because that can be very fulfilling thank you so much um any other final thoughts regarding this question i i think i just everyone said everything the only part that i i've enjoyed a lot in my gap year was i traveled I, during the four years that I was at school, I didn't get to do a lot of traveling. I worked while I was at UCLA, so there wasn't a lot of time to do other stuff. And during my gap year, I made, mm -hmm. I made a point of traveling and putting myself in positions and circumstances that were more different for me than new for me that opened doors that I might not have been or see things from different perspective. And throughout the years, that has helped a lot, kind of traveling, seeing the world, seeing other people's perspective and how they live. Um, it was it was very important for me during my gap year and even all these years later I can still reference back to it during those times and kind of put myself in my clients shoes where they experience certain things that I might not have been if I didn't step outside my comfort zone during my gap year. Thank you so much that's that's actually a really important point so I appreciate that. Um, just kind of looking at the time and making sure the students have an opportunity to connect with you. And again, thank you to the panelists for answering the questions in the chat. Um, I have two final questions that I do want to ask um, quickly. Do you foresee any changes within your um, private practice or industry within, let's say, the next five to 10 years? I know with COVID, things changed as far as in-person virtual, feeling more comfortable, the idea of connecting with patients virtually as opposed to in-person. So the bigger question is, do you foresee any other maybe changes within your profession that students should be maybe more aware of? Um, and along the same lines, um, maybe throw in also your final thought. Like if there was something that you, you really wish you would have known when you were an undergrad about your career path um, that you look back now and say, that would have made a great difference in my decision in my career, or that would have helped me a lot. Um, and we can kind of end it on that note. So. What do you see changing in your profession, if any, any changes and more on the lines of final thoughts? I wish I knew this when I was an undergrad. Um, and uh, Sanam, if we could start with you as well. 
It's interesting. You said what I wish I had known. I recently was talking to some of the people who work for us. And one of the things I wish I had known is to take it easy and take it slow. There is no rush getting there because there is no there. And I think when I was in grad school or undergrad, I was like, I have to get my PhD. I have to get my hours. I have to get certified. I have to get the job. I have to get there as if there is a there that once I get there, it's all good. And I wish I had known that there is no there to take it more easy, to take more chances along the line, to ask not for help necessarily, but for different ways of doing things, for different ways of seeing things. How would, um, and I think the part that I wish I had done for myself, which is what I'm doing now and doing a lot more slower, there's no there there. Um, but I wish someone had told me when I was in undergrad to slow down. Thank you so much. We try to do that every day with our students. <laughs> it's for me, it was because a lot of us grow up with this notion that there is a path you do for your university, you go to grad school, you finish it in a certain amount of time, and then you come out and you get a job. And that's, there is no reason for that. That's, I wish someone would have told me that. Thank you so much. Um, Caroline? Well, the first part of the question was, do you foresee any changes or anything different maybe within the next, I, I apologize for them, you didn't get to discuss that part as well, so you're more than welcome to. You know, yeah. I foresee the field of just mental health getting bigger just because as someone mentioned a little bit earlier, um, it's, I think more and more people are interested in investing in their mental health some of those kind of biases and stigmas that perhaps has been around what it means to get help, what it means to go to therapy, specifically in certain cultures. I think we're seeing that aspect of it kind of dying away more and more. And the, the concept of getting therapy and going to get help from a professional um, from my perspective, it's becoming more and more normalized. So I see, you know, more people are reaching out, more people are open to the idea of even sharing that they're in therapy, which is a big deal. Whereas perhaps in the past, you know, even individuals that were going and were benefiting about it may have not been as open about it because of that level of perhaps shame or stigma around it. So I do think the field is growing um and there's you know more people are open to 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 going to therapy and getting help as far as what I would have known I don't know if it would have made a difference in where I am but I think one of the things that for me kind of stands out is you know if you're doing individual therapy uh, and and base like that's your main work in this field. I really look at it from this perspective, which I may have not understood it when I was, you know, working on my BA or even at the beginning of my grad years is the idea that, you know, those clients come into the office at a very vulnerable place and they're sharing a lot with you. And on some level, they're putting a lot of trust in your experience and what you're bringing up. And, and in a way, their life choices and the routes that they're taking somehow I think becomes dependent on what you're doing with them in that realm. And the reason why I say that is because, you know, throughout the 20 years, I've had quite a bit of clients that may have been with other therapists. And for one reason or another, they change, you know, therapist. And just being around other colleagues, there's so much out there that you hear in regards to, you know, someone that may have gone to get help. And for whatever reason, that therapist was bringing a lot of their own baggage into the room or was giving a lot of life um, advices and, and different ways this client should be doing X, Y, and Z. And that sometimes it becomes actually detrimental rather than helping the client to grow. So I've seen kind of quite a bit of that. And I think the one thing we all want to keep in mind, especially as an undergrad, is like this is a field 
that I really think the client's life on some level is in your hand, not, not that you're making choices for them, but you know, someone pointed out the importance of going to your own therapy and really getting to know yourself and what you're bringing into the room and that awareness that you're there to help that client grow, to learn about themselves, to self-reflect, to become aware of their patterns. And, and that one hour that they're there with you is going to make a huge difference in what they're doing in the outside world. So it's, it's, it's a feel that I think you really, really have to invest a lot of yourself in it to, to do good work. Thank you so much. Um, Cheryl, any changes you foresee? Anything you'd like to add to that question and feedback or final thoughts that you may have for our students? I think our field is changing so much. And I think that uh, one of the things that we found out in the past few years is how incredibly effective working virtually can be, um, including something like EMDR, which we thought for a long time needed to be done in person, and how exciting to realize that we can do that effectively virtually as well. Um, so that opens up more uh, flexibility. Um, that said, I think we have a real healthcare crisis. I think that uh, insurance companies and panels are crushing the souls of all kinds of healthcare workers, including mental health clinicians. Um, I think that we're making some incredible discoveries that I hope the cognitive science people out there are going to be uh, leveraging in, in terms of uh, uh, learning how uh cognitive science and uh, our processing and our attachment system and our fight or flight system and the limbic system and all of these things work together to be able to, to help people in, in deeper ways and also to be able to create other types of support that aren't in clinical delivery. Um, what, what I wish I knew, two things. One, you don't have to do everything just because it's hard. And I think probably Bruins especially need to hear this because you're all achievers or you wouldn't be here. Um, just because it's hard doesn't mean you need to do it. And notice what lights you up. Don't be afraid to specialize and really think about making your life juicy. Have fun. Take care of yourself. Make sure you refill your own cup so that you can show up and do whatever it is that you're choosing. Thank you so much. Um, Lauren, final thoughts, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I think our field is changing tremendously. And I think the pandemic really shot that to the next level. You know, quite frankly, before the pandemic, I thought I would only be doing in-person work. I never imagined myself doing teletherapy. I envisioned having an office, you know, in person. And since I got licensed during the pandemic, my practice is pretty much solely virtual. Um, what's really cool about that is that when you're licensed in the state of California, I have clients in San Francisco and San Diego, and I'm here in Los Angeles. Um, what's also, I think, going to be a game changer for our field, at least for psychologists, is what's called SIPACT. Check this out. Um, a lot of states now have a reciprocity where you can be in one state and be able to work with clients in other states as well. California is not there yet. We'll see if they get there. But I think that's something to think about for you as a potential clinician someday. Would you want to be in person with clients or would you want to have a virtual practice? I do think it kind of depends sometimes on the work that you want to do. I am definitely a a cognitive therapist. I love working with anxiety, exposure response prevention work for OCD. I find that translates pretty well virtually. But if you are really interested in somatic body work, um, and other things that can present in the room where you really need that in-person interaction, that may be something you want to think about in terms of the clients you want to work with. Um, so I, I see that being probably the biggest change for our field coming up ahead. And something I wish I knew is that uh, a psychologist, a therapist, a social worker, whatever you pursue, it can be anybody. I think I really had in my mind almost what you see on TV of like what a therapist is in a way. And 
you can be anything as a therapist. If there's a population you want to work with, if uh, you want to work at a rehabilitation facility or a PHP as Sanam does, uh, if you want to be a couples or sex therapist like Alexandra, there is a space for everybody in this field. So if you are passionate about helping a certain population or a certain presentation, there is a niche for you. And I, I wish somebody had shared that with me when I was starting out. So yeah. Thank you so much. And Alexandra. Uh, what changes do I see in the field? Um, I mean, certainly with pandemic, as everyone has said, we have moved into a virtual world. Um, I personally am a bigger fan of in-person. I think I'm kind of old school in that way, perhaps. Um, but it's what I grew up with as a couples therapist, seeing people's body movements, how they twitch when their partner just said that thing, um, <laughs> is just so, so important to me. You can feel the energy of somebody in the room. Um, so, you know, my practice has really been migrating back into in-person. Um, I am about 50, 50 right now. Maybe it's actually more in person at this point, which I'm loving. Um, there are some really great aspects to, I think, the TikTok, um, Instagram world of psychology really emerging there. And as everyone said, kind of really normalizing mental health um, and self-care. Um, and I think that that has been a really huge transition. Um, I think it's also highlighted how unavailable it is for so many people and how, you know, messed up our system is. And in, I mean, as Cheryl was saying around the insurance system, it's really awful. Um, I think that one kind of downside that I have also seen on TikTok, maybe I'm the only person who says something negative or like in that space is that there can also be messaging that isn't clinically appropriate. Um, and so it's like really making sure that like who you're listening to, who you're following is really a grounded individual because right now anyone can say anything and kind of I don't know, the, sometimes that, that can feel kind of damaging. And, and, and so that's the one aspect to it that I'm, I'm not super into. There's also some of these apps out there that have therapy where you can kind of text in. And I don't know that that feels as connected. I mean, I'm, I'm primarily a relational adult therapist. And I think that when we are in a bad place, we are social creatures, we are pack animals, we need connection. That is where we find healing. And when it's via text, I mean, if that's all you got, great but that's not enough. And I don't want that to be the direction that this field moves into. I think we need human contact. I think we need more time together, not less. Thank you so much on that note. Um, I wanted to go ahead and thank our panelists for being here this evening, for your time and dedication to our Bruins, for answering questions in the chat and so on, and continuing the conversation in our breakout room. So, so thank you again for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, we're going to go ahead and end the, the recording at this point.